Hello, welcome to First Chapter Friday. Our story today is The Girls I've Been, and it's by Tess Sharp. Part one, truth is a weapon. The first 87 minutes. It was supposed to be 20 minutes. That's what I told myself when I woke up that morning. It would be just 20 minutes. We'd meet in the bank parking lot. We'd go in, we'd make the deposit, and it would be awkward. It would be so awkward, but it would be 20 minutes tops. I could survive 20 minutes with my ex-boyfriend and my new girlfriend. I could handle the awkwardness. I was a freaking champ. I even got donuts, thinking maybe that would help smooth things over after last night's makeout interruption, which I know is downplaying what happened. I get fried dough can't fix everything, but still, everyone loves donuts, especially when they have sprinkles or bacon or both. So I get the donuts and coffee because Iris is basically a grizzly bear unless she downs some caffeine in the morning. And of course that makes me late. By the time I pull up to the bank, they're both already there. Wes is out of his truck tall and blonde, and leaning against the chipped tailgate, the bank envelope with all the cash from last night next to him. Iris is lounging on the hood of her Volvo in her watercolor dress, her curls swinging as she plays with that lighter she found on the railroad tracks. She's going to set her brush out on fire one of these days, I swear to God. You're late is the first thing Wes says when I get out of my car. I bought donuts. I hand Iris her coffee and she hops off the hood. Thanks. Can we just get this over with? He asks. He doesn't even look at the donuts. My stomach clenches. Are we really back to this? How can we be back to this after everything? I press my lips together, trying not to look too annoyed. Fine. I put the bakery box back in my car. Let's go. I snatch up the envelope from his tailgate. The bank's just opened, so there are only two people ahead of us. Iris fills out the deposit slip, and I stand in line with Wes right behind me. The line moves as Iris walks over with the slip, taking the envelope from me and tucking it into her purse. She looks warily at Wes, then at me. I bite my lip. Just a few more minutes. Iris sighs. Look, she says to Wes, propping her hands on her hips. I understand the way you found out wasn't great, but that's when Iris was interrupted, but not by Wes. No, Iris gets interrupted by the guy in front of us. Because the guy in front of us? He's chosen that moment to pull out a gun and start robbing the freaking bank. The first thing I think is, shite. The second thing I think is, get down. And the third thing I think is, we're all going to die because I waited for bacon donuts. That's the end of chapter one, but I will give you a gift of several more chapters since they're so quick. Chapter two, 9, 12 a.m. 15 seconds, captive. The robber, white guy, six feet maybe, brown jacket, black t-shirt, red ball cap, pale eyes and brows, yells, get on the floor. You know, like bank robbers do. We hit the floor. It's like everyone in the bank is a puppet and he's cut all of our strings. I can't breathe around it for a second. This giant lump of fear in my stomach, chest and throat. It burns, it snags in the soft parts of me, and I want to cough, but I'm scared that I'll draw his attention. You never want to draw their attention. I know this because this isn't the first time I've been here. I mean, I've never been in the middle of a bank robbery, but sometimes it feels like I was born in the line of fire. When someone points a gun at you, it's not like in the movies. There are no brave moments in those first seconds. It's bone shaking, pants peeing scary. 
Iris's arm presses against mine, and I can feel her trembling. I want to reach out and grab her hand, but I stop myself. What if he thinks I'm reaching for a weapon? Everyone and their mother has guns in Clear Creek. I can't risk it. Wes is tense on my other side, and it takes me a second to realize why. Because he's getting ready to spring at the guy. That's my ex for you. Wes is instinctual and heroic and has such bad judgment when it comes to tricky situations. This time I do move. I have to. Wes will get himself shot otherwise. I grab his thigh and dig my nails into his skin, right under the hem of his shorts. His head jerks to me, and I glare at him. Uh, don't you dare look. I shake my head once, and I glare more. I can practically see the but Nora in his raised eyebrows until he finally slumps down defeated. Okay, okay. Breathe. Focus. The robber. He's shouting at the teller. The teller? Is there only one? Why is there only one? Is a middle-aged blonde lady with glasses looped on an aqua chain. My mind's in overdrive, noting things like, I'll need them later. He's shouting about the bank manager. It's hard to hear because the teller is full out sobbing. She's all shaking hands and red cheeks, and there's no way the silent alarm got pushed unless she did by accident. With a gun in her face, she is in full on panic mode. Can't blame her. You never know how you're going to react until the gun's actually out. None of the three of us have fainted yet, so I figure we're good, for now. Something. But when it comes to saving the day, Teller is out. Sheriff's not coming unless someone hits the alarm. My eyes track to the left best I can without moving my head too much. Is there another Teller hiding somewhere? Where's the security guard? Do they even have one at this branch? Footsteps behind me. I tense, and Iris lets out a little gasp. I press my arm even harder against hers, wishing I could flood reassurance into her through our skin. But when there's a gun, there's not really a lot of that to give. Wait. Footsteps rushed. As they pass me, I look up enough to see the sawed-off shotgun in the guy's hand as he circles his way up to the front. It's a slow jolt to my chest, all dread and churning sick. It's not just one guy. It's two. Two robbers, both white, clean jeans, heavy boots, black t-shirts, no logos. I swallow with a click. My mouth dry like the desert, my heart doing a tap dance in the rhythm of we're gonna die, holy boop, we're gonna die. My hands are sweating. I clench them. God, how long has it been? Two minutes? Five? Time goes funny when you're pressed to the floor with a gun swinging in your face. And for the first time, I think about Lee. Oh no, Lee. I can't get shot. My sister will kill me, but first she'll make it her life's mission to hunt down whoever shot me. And when she's got a mission, Lee's scary. I speak from experience because when I was 12, Lee got me away from my mom with a kind of long con that even the queen of the grift didn't see coming. She's in prison now, mom, not Lee. And I helped put her there. I can't let fear take over. I have to keep calm and find a way out. This is a problem. Work the problem. Fix the problem. When we came in, who else was in the bank other than the teller? I trace it back in my head. There'd been a woman at the front of the line. Red Cap pushed her aside when he started shouting. Now she's on the floor to my left. Her purse tossed a foot away. Gray Cap had come up behind us. He must have been sitting in the waiting area. My stomach somersaults when I remember that another person had been sitting there. A kid. I can't turn my head enough to see where she ended up, 
but I glanced at her when I came in. She's 10, maybe 11. Does she belong with the woman in the front? She must. But I've got a perfect line of sight on that woman and she hasn't even glanced toward the chairs where the kid was. Okay, five grown-ups, or almost grown-ups, one kid, two bank robbers, two guns, at least maybe more. Those are some bad numbers. We want in the basement. Red Cap keeps shoving his gun in the teller's face and it's not helping. It's making her more scared. And if he keeps doing it, stop shouting. It's the first time Gray Cap's spoken. His voice is gruff, not like he's trying to disguise it, but like that's just the way it is. Like, Years of living have torn the insides out and all that's left is a suggestion of a voice. Instantly, Red Cap steps back. Get the cameras, Gray Cap orders. And the one in red scurries through the bank lobby behind the teller stands, cutting the cords of the security cameras before returning to Gray Cap's side. Iris nudges me. She's watching them as hard as I am. I press back to let her know I see it too. The guy in red may have made the first move, but Gray Cap's the one in charge. Where's Freyan? Gray Cap asks. He's not here, the teller says. She's lying, Red Cap scoffs. He licks his lips. He's spooked at the thought. Who's Freyan? Go look, Gray Cap orders. Red Cap shoes past us, and he disappears from the lobby. I take advantage of the moment as soon as I'm sure he's out of sight and Gray Cap's distracted by the teller to turn my head to the right. The kids under the coffee table, in the middle of the waiting area, and even this far away, I can see her shaking. The kid was whispers to me. His eyes are on her too. I know, I mouth. I wish she'd meet my eyes so I could at least shoot her some sort of reassuring look. But she's got her face pressed up against the ugly brown carpet. Footsteps. Fear kicks up a notch in my chest as Red Cap comes back. Manage's office is locked! The panic in his voice makes it crack. Where's Fran? Gray Cap demands again. He's late! The teller squeaks out. He had to go get Judy, our other teller. Her car wouldn't start. He, he's just late. Something has gone wrong. Whatever they have planned, the first step's been messed up. And when people screw up, in my experience, they do one of two things. They either run or they double down. For a split second, I think they may run that we'll get out of this with nightmares and a story that'll give us mileage at every party for the rest of our lives. But then any hope of that gets shattered. It's like slow motion. The bank door swings open. And that security guard I'd been wondering about walks in, his hands full of coffee cups. He doesn't have a chance. Red cap, impulsive, shaky, way too spooked, shoots before the guy can drop the lattes and reach for his stun baton. The cups fall to the ground, then so does the guard. Blood blossoms at his shoulder, a small stain growing bigger by the second. Things happen in rapid movement, like I'm being sped through a flip book, because this is where it gets real. Before the trigger's pulled, there's a slim chance of okayness that you can hold on to. After, not so much. As the guard falls forward, someone, the teller, screams. Wes throws himself toward Iris and me to shield us, and we curl up tight until we're this muddle of legs and arms and fear and hurt feelings that we really should be putting aside, all things considered. And me, I grab my cell phone. I don't know if I'll have another chance. I slide it out of my jeans pocket as Gray Cap swears, stepping past our tangle on his way to disarm the guard and yell at Red Cap. Wes is leaning on it, so I can barely move my arm but I managed to tap out a message to Lee. Olive, five letters, 
definitely not my favorite food, technically a fruit, just like a tomato, and maybe the key to our freedom. For as long as I've known my sister, it's been our distress code. We are girls who prepare for storms. Lee will come. My sister always shows up and she'll bring the cavalry. Okay, it just is a ball of action. One thing happening after another. I, I did read this a bit ago, but I believe the majority of it probably, I don't know, maybe this much is all about the bank and then the rest is outside of the bank. Don't want to tell you what happens, who survives, if there's any deaths. I don't want to tell you what all the subplots are, but trust me, they are amazing. And um, yeah, I hope you read the book. It really is worthy of all the book talk uh, reviews and positive reviews that's on Amazon and elsewhere. Hope you have a great week. Take care, everyone. Thanks for watching.